Hello and welcome to a bit of a different episode of Ramblings this week, in which I have the honour of being interviewed by the lovely Kimmy for her YouTube and blog posts. And this week we will be discussing a range of jewellery related topics, so please stay tuned to learn more and listen to the full interview. Thanks for yourself, sort of, like uh, coming to do like this kind of like um, interview thing. No problem, no problem at all. I was quite honoured to be asked. Yeah, <laughs> I think cause I seen you post on your um, your YouTube about the um, I guess how uh, the jewellery is like kind of immortal, and I was like, oh, that's quite interesting because I think that's and like my my goal is to try to get people to think differently about mm -hmm. design and and also jewellery, and not think of it being like just aesthetic. Um, so maybe I can like start off and say like, um, yes, yeah, so like as you know, like kind of my my jewelry sort of, or or I like to design for someone's like well being, and I believe that jewelry um, and also experiences um, has this like power to to manage um, a person's like mental health, um, and I believe this is done through like functional purposes of jewelry uh, rather than the attention of being totally focused on aesthetics and yeah, I kind of just. I feel that doing doing this kind of can maybe broaden someone's mind a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the power that jewellery has isn't just a question of wanting to look good. I mean, you just think of someone that, even if it's something that's not been designed with the intention of having that extra meaning or so on, if you're just looking at a basic piece of jewellery that was gifted at some point, um, the power that it then has to be cathartic to be kind of close to someone's emotions and so on is so strong that even if you just think of complete breakdowns and and just from a small object and it's kind of an amazing power that it holds so that's just for something that's not been designed with that intention in mind and if you in my mind if you design something with that extra intention with that extra bit that that power just kind of get in, gets enhanced and the meaning and that kind of love for the object just gets enhanced, definitely. For sure. And, and like, with, with your own, like, Julia, like, um, like you, what's your take on, like, the sort of power that it has maybe for your users? Well, um, the way that I am... Um, well, when I'm inspired to just create my own pieces... Mine's very much to do with the world that surrounds us. So it's very much to do with nature and kind of looking beyond the kind of structure of man and going back to that kind of primitive side. Because I find that a very kind of cathartic subject. Personally, if I'm having like a really bad day or whatever, I take myself out for a walk and even just sit in a, um, a park or something and just look at nature. Mm -hmm. For me, that is my catharsis. And I kind of bring that into my designs, but I also like to kind of educate on the other side of things. So uh, I like to look beyond just what I see yeah. and I get into just the kind of research bug, as it were. And I start looking at the sounds that it produces or the way that it moves or something that isn't obvious, but I'm trying to actually immortalize that, that creation, that, that, beautiful thing by not just saying right it looks like this I'm like yes but how does how does it feel how does it smell how does it how does it actually interact with the world around it so that's what I find soothing mm. and that's kind of the inspiration for my work and I feel that nature is something that is soothing on a kind of pan-global um, aspect but another part of my business that I'm now hoping to focus more on is working more with a client mm -hmm. and obviously from the work that I'm doing they can see my kind of style my kind of take on it and that 
I'll always try and go that step further to design something that really means something to them. But I want to do it in a way that is really personal to them. Mm. So really working closely with with the, the client and what they want and trying to really help them capture that. But I kind of, I want to try and give them almost like more than they think they'll get out of it in that sense of for me jewelry as, a, as you were saying like it's kind of an immortal aspect and just your love for something or your love for that jewel I feel that it should not be a story that's forgotten mm. so one thing that I've started doing is actually accompanying every piece of jewelry that I make with a posterity book okay so it's a booklet that um when someone buys it or when someone buys it to gift or, or whatever, um, you put in an entry of who you are or who you're gifting it to, uh, the date and a story about why, that story that you want to capture. Because obviously buying a piece of jewellery is a big moment, especially when it's something that commemorative and so on. And I just have this thing of I feel that that story should not be forgotten so basically they enter it and then it has the potential to become an heirloom because there are further entries to then who gets the piece of jewelry afterwards and entering their story and their attachment to it and why that could be the case so I'm trying to basically reinvent what an heirloom is because for me every piece of jewelry has the potential to be an heirloom because it has that strong personal bond with someone it defines your style, it defines your loves, it defines a moment in time or a person or something Mm -hmm. that you want to commemorate. And that kind of came from something that I always felt quite dearly when I was a kid. I always had this kind of memory box and it just had loads of pieces of jewellery in it from like loads of relatives that had finally kind of come to this kind of little black box and it was mine all of a sudden. But And I just loved sitting there and just looking at each piece and imagining all the stories of where they'd been before me and who'd worn them. And like most of the time, I have to say, like, it's from a child's fevered imagination. It was kind of Jane Austen style, like, oh, I'm down, I'm distressed or something along those lines. But one thing that I felt was really missing was the actual certainty of knowing who had it before and why they've done this and why they've done that. And I think that's what I'm trying to capture now in, in my work and the, the way that I want to work with clients is kind of give them those tools to really immortalize their story and take it through generations. So say four or five generations from now, someone that never actually knew you knows you. Yeah. Well, to attach to to that story yeah and give it like hone the wonderful power of jewelry and just give it that extra little boost so that people aren't forgotten nice. that's basically my kind of aim with it <laughs> that's great because it's kind of like you're capturing someone's like personality as well and like I guess them in a jewelry <sighs> form in a way yeah yeah that's that's what I'm really hoping to I mean as I said, I love designing my big pieces and kind of because that is what I'm it's almost like a, a personal brief that I'm I'm setting myself, obviously. And and it's kind of immortalizing my views to a certain aspect and, and that sort of thing. And a lot of people can find similarities to approach and, and that sort and that's that side of it. But when it's kind of working once something kind of specific. I just, I love that feeling of they're getting exactly what they wanted and they're getting what, like something that is so close to them that they couldn't otherwise have. Mm -hmm. And that for me is the the big thing. It it doesn't matter what I'm designing really. It's it's to do with trying to capture their personality, their memories and, and their story. And I think that's that's the most beautiful part. I mean, I had this commission recently for this um, young guy and he's, I'm not allowed to say names or anything because he's not proposed yet. So I'm not, yeah. not going to jinx it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, he, he commissioned me for an engagement ring. And it was just such an amazing 
process because I I just got him to talk about not like oh I want a ring and I want it with this stone in this setting kind of thing I just sat him down and I was like right okay tell me about her and he just spilled out because initially he was like oh I want a ring but I don't know what style and I don't know what and I was like right okay I don't need to know about that for now I need to know about what she likes what do you think about when you think of her yeah and he just spilled out his guts and you could see the amount of love the amount of just kind of passion that went with it and instantly we came up with a, a design and he's really happy with it. it's currently in the post and just like locked down in Heathrow and I'm like oh come on this is <laughs> cool <laughs> yeah because in New Zealand he's um He's from New Zealand, so it's all in lockdown at the moment. So I'm like, oh, no, come on. <laughs> it must be on lockdown as well. I'll be like, I can't get it until I get, I get it. <laughs> so we just keep tracking the parcel. We're like, no, it's still in Heathrow. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully it'll get there safe and sound. But yeah, yeah he, he's, he, it was, but yeah, again, the, the experience itself, it was just absolutely amazing. And I think that that experience especially is what turned me to this is definitely what I want to be concentrating on. And yeah, then I'll have my forays into my big creations that will go on like elements or down in London and stuff. And that's kind of my, my passion for making and that kind of thing. But I think the, the main focus of it and the reason why I make is to try and capture someone's personality, someone's stories and try and make another human being happy. Mm, that's really good. Cause it's it's uh I guess this was kind of like in a way about like the the whole thing about how you can like personalize it I think as well yeah definitely and, and I think it's different for everyone because I feel that if you just personalize something in one way personalization mm -hmm. is for someone it can be a, an engraved name or something but for someone it can just be something that's much more abstract something yeah. that only they know and um, yeah I think that's the challenge and that's the challenge that I really I really like doing of just picking up on their personality and what they really are like and what they would like and trying to trying to capture that in a way that that is what they wanted oh, I see. so like you said about uh you give them like little books mm -hmm. like, what do you put in them like what's so basically, I give a kind of a few bits of documentation. So uh, I kind of want it to be almost like a box that you can look at and, and so on. So for just kind of general small purchases from like my collections or for like a small commission and so on, I as space for documentation for four generations. So even if it's planned or unplanned that a piece of jewelry gets passed down, it's something almost inevitable because jewelry is kind of eternal. So even if you don't plan at that point to pass it down to anyone, you may get to a point in your life where you maybe have kids or you have a nephew or you have grandkids or whatever, and that moment might present itself and you want to make a momentous occasion of it. And it's just I, I want to give them the option of kind of documenting who they are, why this piece is important to them, and then who they're gifting it to and why, mm -hmm. and have that kind of thing of it's not just the kind uh, the the bit of documentation of so and so own this in so and so year. I want them to tell their story, so I give them space to kind of document who they are why when it was why and then just space to just tell their story and make it kind of a very intimate booklet mm -hmm. so that's one thing that I do and then for my commissions I do another little booklet that is specific for that commission mm -hmm. so for instance for the engagement ring it was something that really commemorated the design behind it and why it was made so it became actually a very personal booklet about the couple and the every aspect of the ring that was kind of designed and why it relates back to the couple and so on so I included like um phrases of 
um, this man and how he described his um, his hopefully soon to be fiance, and because they were such beautiful ways of just, for instance, I'd um, I'd asked him like how how would you describe her in a few words, and he was like she's a penguin, and I was like right. I love that I, I love that <laughs> that's going in, <laughs> but it's it's just that way of capturing those moments and capturing not just a booklet that's like well this is a ring in 18 karat white gold and it has so and so settings yeah. and yes i want to include that information as well because it's useful to know for for them in years to come if they need it cleaned or if they need it something like that so it's practical information about this that and the other but i want it to be personal so it's mainly just about their story their their love and their future story as well. And it, I think it's something that they can treasure almost as a, a little heirloom in itself. And then it can be passed down with the piece of jewelry so that people can remember like, oh, do you remember granny and granddad? Like, this is how they felt about each other. And yeah. like, I want to immortalize them yeah. and be able to let them live on for future generations because stories told from like, uh, father to son and mother to daughter they're beautiful but there's only a finite amount that it can kind of be told without being like the fish story and things change and evolve and then sometimes they just get lost and I just hate for someone's life and someone's feelings to get lost and that's what I'm trying to avoid and try and give the tools so that it won't get lost because it's there in writing and it can kind of be carried on with as as an heirloom in itself so those are the two different kind of things that that I'm doing with basically any piece of jewelry that you'd get at least the um the posterity booklet and just it doesn't matter because it can be like the smallest piece of jewelry but to you it means much more than doesn't matter what materials it's in if it's got a tie to you and it could be something that becomes an heirloom then why not document it and hope that it becomes an heirloom <laughs> that's so beautiful because then it's like it's such a, a little like journal in a way yeah that's definitely what i'm i'm hoping to capture but so wow. far it's, it's kind of a very recent development and it was just it kind of helped a little bit being um in lockdown i have to say because i started the vanilla inc incubator program and again i was thinking of like the business side of things but as a usual maker, I was just hiding behind my bench most of the time going, you know, I'll just keep making and I'll just keep making more stuff. Um, but being in lockdown, and especially because I just moved in with uh, my boyfriend to do the vanilla ink thing. Oh, yeah. But I have a workshop back home with my parents in air. Yeah. But as soon as lockdown hit, I was here. So I have no work, no working. No bench kind of major tools are back in air where I've got my main workshop and obviously the nil ink is, is closed and you can't get to it because of isolation. Um, so I was just literally faced with the situation of being a workaholic and being a makeaholic and not being able to get to a workshop. And honestly, like it was tough. It was really tough, but I just started going, well, I've got all this time on my hands. I might as well actually focus on the business side of things. And yeah all the stuff that I'm scared to broach uh so I just kind of I started just questioning like why do I do what I do mm -hmm. and all these things and back to when I kind of had that first relationship with jewelry with those kind of jewels in a box kind of thing and I was like that's why I started all this that's why I started making and that's why I love jewelry mm -hmm. And I want to get back to that and I want to be closer to, to that. And it's something that I'm, I'm passionate about. I'm always going to be passionate about because I've always been passionate about. So, so yeah, as I said, it's very recent and I've not really properly managed to test it out because being kind of, as I said, on, on lockdown and so on, people are um, watching a lot of what they're spending and so on. So obviously jewelry is not really a primary item. It's not really a necessity. So um my sales have just kind of been zero and obviously not being able to take commissions you're just like oh, I'm sorry I thought that. <laughs> so I'm hoping that it will take off and I'm I'm hoping
feedback on it as well to see because at the moment the booklet has got like up to four generations but I kind of want to see what people kind of respond to and if they say actually I'd really like a booklet that's like eight or 12 generations something that's really really longer or someone that's going oh well actually maybe just like a couple would do so I'm just waiting on a bit of feedback on that and just I'm actually just really excited to get back to normal and get back to kind of making and and just making it because with each commission that I have like I'll have an entire couple of weeks of making that kind of unique booklet for that commission and for them and I just really want to get started with it kind of thing and it's just I'm, I'm really excited to get started I'm like I just don't have tools to jump in <laughs> oh, it's so much amazing you just yeah I, I get the feeling <laughs> yeah but yeah I'm definitely it works and that people like it and that I can make a go of it so yeah no it's a concept that I've not like heard of so far so it's it's really like good and it's very like touching I think here thank you <laughs> um so uh I guess like so do you think it's possible that Julie can have like this kind of narrative that you that bring people together as you say like definitely definitely um I mean anyone that I've spoken to that kind of you, you start a conversation like oh what do you do oh, I'm a jeweler they always tell you about their favorite piece of jewelry and why and it's almost like a natural instinct and the natural response and uh, and I just love it I love hearing all these stories and I was like oh this piece like and I think people a lot of the time they kind of this some of their jewelry if it's something that's not if it's something that's like smaller or kind of less precious materials and stuff and they're like oh but it, it's only this I'm like there's no it's only about it because it's it's not to do with the material it's not to do with the value like the intrinsic value of it it's to do with the emotional value mm -hmm. and you can have someone that I mean it could be even just like one of those plastic rings from a cereal box but if it's important to you because of that specific moment then there's nothing to lessen that piece but I just I love hearing people's stories about it and how it's important and most of the time it is from a human connection and a narrative that's passed down mm -hmm. so it's kind of my mother gave me this or my father left me get this or this is something that my sister gave me after a huge fight and we promised we'd never fight again. like you know that sort of thing and it, it's something that sometimes reminds you so a concept or a value that you really really hold dear and it kind of it kind of gives you that power or that security or I mean I remember as a kid I had this necklace that I like I was never seen without like there are people that know me from back in Italy where I grew up that they still remember me as the girl with the crystal yes. and I just had this little crystal on a necklace and it was something that my mum gave me when I was five years old um, and it was the first time because I was raised by a single mum and we were never apart she was a musician I was always like touring with her and I was always traveling with her but for this tour that well for this job that she went on I couldn't go with her so this was the first time that I would have not been with her so she gave me this piece of jewelry that she had that was given to her by a friend and like there's a whole narrative before that but for me it started at this point and she gave it to me telling me that this crystal had magic properties and that if I got scared and if I got lonely and if I missed her all I needed to do was to grab the crystal and rub it and talk into it and she could hear me now I know that's a whole load of baloney and years later when I grew up I knew that wasn't true and yet I still had the instinct instinct of when I felt troubled or when I felt alone I would just take it and just rub it and just kind of and it would soothe me Interesting. And it was something that for me was very powerful. And that's kind of, and unfortunately, through a kind of bullying incident of getting a football in the face, that oh. necklace broke. Oh. Yeah. And it was, I was devastated because it was just like, it was so, so important to me. Mm. But 
also because like by this time I was about must have been about 13 or 14 when this happened but like as a kid I always wanted to have like a family and I always wanted to have children and I just had this in my mind that when I had children and when I had a kid that got to that point in their life for some moment's occasion I would pass that necklace down and tell the exact same story and th that th I felt like the person that broke it just like took not just like a piece of jewelry away from me they took like that whole story away from me so hopefully I can replace the jewelry and carry on the story but it doesn't quite feel the same way yeah you're kind of like replacing the the memory in a way yeah yeah but yeah it's I think it, there is a huge huge strength in the narrative I think this is definitely something that shouldn't be undervalued and it's definitely something that should be honoured and embraced. And I think a lot of the time people just associate jewellery with something frivolous mm -hmm. and something that is just to do with like looking pretty or mm -hmm. showing off how much money you have or whatever. And I personally believe that's not the case and it's never been the case. I did um, a talk in one of my videos about kind of the, the well the, it was the one about the immortality of, of jewelry because it's always had that value of the narrative even back to um kind of prehistoric times and even like if you look at for instance the old navajo tribes mm -hmm. a lot of their jewelry you see it as kind of well it's like fur it's teeth it's all this kind of thing it's obviously for like bragging purposes and just the kind commemorate the animal that they had killed and actually honor honor it and honor the sacrifice that it's made and it was it was not a bragging thing it was more of a I've taken something away and I should remember that I shouldn't take that lightly mm -hmm. so there's always that narrative that's kind of taken down from the very start and somewhere in the middle I feel that that got undervalued and that got lost and it just kind of became about material goods mm -hmm. but no matter what point in history you go and no matter the main reason behind a piece of jewelry you will always find that there is a narrative somewhere there is a meaning somewhere yeah. it's just sometimes hidden that's true it's, it's only when you sort of maybe put an attention towards it I think it starts the story starts to begin yeah, yeah. I mean, you even just look at the the artifacts that you find um, nowadays, and the historians are using them. If it had no narrative and if it had no meaning behind it, then it would kind of just be a worthless object. Yeah. Just classify of well, so and so. This thing probably dates to this time, and that's it. But it actually tells us a lot more. It tells us the kind of personality of the person that was behind it, it tells us, I mean, a lot of the time you hear these things of, oh, Napoleon gifted this to his wife and all this because she loved this or because he wanted to commemorate that. And even just that because, we only know it because of that piece of jewellery. And there is a narrative. And most of the time, these narratives we can only guess at because it is something very personal and they haven't been documented. They haven't been kind of stored anywhere so we can only guess but there is something behind there that's true um so i, I feel like um you know because i've seen uh, your work from beginning kind of middle and end like because we both went to like the same like uni together and i've seen you grow um what's kind of like made you sort of decide to do the sort of like um like immortality kind of theme from i I think it's just from personal values um, because I realized that was the reason why I got into jewelry in the first place. Um, so for me, it's there's a part of it as well that's um, it's kind of a very personal aspect of I don't deal with mortality well. Um, I've had to try uh, more times than I am happy to, uh, and I've never, never coped with it well. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's that kind of thing of I want to try and capture some sort of immortality. I mean, everyone to an extent wants to have that immortal aspect. 
obviously immortality is not a thing. It, you can't, no matter where you look, no matter how you chase it, you're not going to find it as such. But there are different immortalities out there. And for me, there was something of this that kind of, it it's jewelry in itself is beyond just an object and it has this power that kind of gives me a feeling of tranquility mm. and it gives me a feeling of this is the closest that I can get to that kind of immortal point and all of the time it's not to do with my immortality as such but it's the immortality of other people and just making sure that they're not forgotten and that they're still with us when when they're not as it were so um so yeah that's that's my main driving force and it, it just it all started from just actually really questioning myself and questioning why I started jewelry because obviously as a maker you get just kind of swept away by all the kind of making sides of things and I absolutely love that I love kind of looking at innovative materials and new designs and all this kind of thing but the real reason why I started this was to pursue this kind of course and this is why I love jewelry so I feel that I need to go back to my roots and and actually embrace it and yes apply everything else that I've learned and still will learn in years to come to this and become the best maker that I possibly can but the reason why I make and how I make is is definitely from from that nice because I feel like I like everyone can relate to you know you're you're kind of like making to a point and then you're like but why am I doing this and I, I, at one point as well I think I, I kind of like did a wee kind of plan and like kind of like why why are you doing jewelry and I was like all oh, right yeah I I know why you, you kind of do yeah straight from your your initial goal yeah and the thing is like it's as you said you you kind of get swept off and especially at uni I mean it's it's a great place because you learn a lot of stuff you kind of go out of your comfort zone on a lot of different things but it is very much about the what rather than the why yeah so you are you're doing these things and you're, you've got these briefs that you're you're setting yourself and it's just like oh I'm going to do a brief about I don't know the DNA or or something like that and and they're all really fascinating and really interesting and and sometimes it's just to do with the material, the process itself, or like even using 3D printing or and you get really engrossed in this. Mm. But it's almost like you've got the house, but you don't have the foundations. Sure. So it's gonna be it's gonna be great, but at some point it's gonna collapse in on itself because you don't you're not using that driving force that's pushing you to make. And if you just make stuff that's yeah, aesthetically interesting you can only go so far because at the end of the day you're not just selling a pandora necklace that's doing it for kind of fashion or whatever like you're you're selling something unique you're offering something unique mm -hmm. and if you don't put yourself into that then you're not really you're not really engaging with with the people that might want to buy your your stuff in at the end of the day so yeah I I, I feel that it's like yeah you, you always come out of uni going right I can make this and I do this but why yeah exactly <laughs> and you just you kind of go through that point where you're just questioning absolutely everything and and your usual kind of way of doing it is always questioning what you make and you're like oh maybe the collection has gone stale or maybe I need to rethink this or maybe I shouldn't be doing this and a lot of the time yeah you need to stay fresh and you need to like question that all, but that isn't the main thing that you should be questioning from a starting point it's it's always to do with the why do you make why do you want to do, do jewelry like this is it's it's more than just a job this is a vocation and why did you get sucked into it like why are you doing it and it's a tough question and it took me like a good few weeks to actually like answer it and I was like I don't know why, <laughs> why do I make I like it yeah. um, <laughs> but it's it's a tough question to ask and it sounds like a stupid thing to say that like you don't know why you do it but 
you get so sucked up with everything else that you forget and you just need to give yourself time to actually remember why you did it in the first place. Exactly. And and when you tell people, there's more meaning behind it as well, like your reasons. Absolutely. Instead of doing what is usually done at even degree shows and going, oh, what's your work about? Well, it's about this. And you're like, you're, you're talking about the topic, but you're not talking about the why. You're not talking about yourself. There's, there's a detachment between you, the maker, the topic, and the creations. And there should always be the underlying why yeah. to each part. Because then, apart from the fact that you're more passionate about it, you're more passionate about talking about it, you won't, you won't get bored after a while of going, oh, if I have to say this thing one more time. <laughs> but it is because you've got a clarity of why you do what you do. And I think that, yes, I mean, if you're any kind of creative, you're always going to be questioning yourself. You're always going to be questioning if your work's good enough, if it's like innovative enough, if it's this enough or if it's that enough. But I think that this kind of driving force gives you that bit more confidence and security in knowing that at least why you're doing it is right. Mm. And then everything else, you can get better at this or you can learn this or you can do that, but at least you're not questioning your foundations. And I feel that that a lot of the time is what makes a lot of people fold Mm. is because they maybe haven't given themselves time to actually question why they did it in the first place and have have that grounding. Mm. And then the doubts just get too much and the questioning just gets too much. And Unfortunately, you get a lot of very talented makers that in the kind of first year or couple of years, they they fold and they just do something else because they're not getting maybe the response that they wanted. They're not getting the kind of clients. And yeah, it's a long haul and it's a gamble. You're self-employed. You're doing this by yourself. It's It's not easy in today's market or in any market. So it is tough, but when you've got those nagging doubts, even at the foundations of what you're doing and you're constantly questioning it, then it's it's very difficult to come through it. But if you can actually question yourself and go, why am I doing this? Mm. At least you've got that driving force of going, okay, well, maybe this collection isn't working or maybe this kind of work isn't working and I should be looking at this. But at least you've got the, the you've got the foundations to rebuild instead of, nothing to rebuild on if that makes sense exactly I feel like sometimes if you're passionate about it it's enough that you could try and make it work and if there's something you that's maybe not working that maybe particular collection you could tweak it in such such way that yeah can be helpful yeah yeah definitely definitely um so like I was just gonna ask about the um kind of there's a form over uh, function kind of battle apparently going on so um so do you think in like the jewelry industry like mm-hmm. or where it's headed do you think it's going to stay like the same in like sort of the aesthetic sense um or do you think people's views are changing or will change uh and seeing jewelry is more of a um is more is more to being just nice and think um it could be yeah like in a functional kind of value to be honest, I think I'm quite optimistic in this sense. And I I, I think I'm, I'm speaking more out of hope than anything. But at the same time, I'm, I'm quite optimistic of it because I think it is changing. I think the view of what it is, is very much changing. People are wanting something that has meaning because if you look at the way that society is going, the way that the economy is going as well, from maybe like the 70s and 80s where you had the kind of materialistic boom that's when really kind of jewelry just became to show everyone had more money everyone had a bit more to spend you started getting much newer alloys in so it made jewelry a lot more affordable which are all good things in themselves but unfortunately it came in the kind of materialistic boom and mass production and all this so it just became there was a loss of care and a loss of understanding and the loss of meaning because it was just an accessory Mm. jewelry was just classed as one of the accessories like you had a belt you had jewelry you had and it was just to complete an outfit while I think now there's people are stepping back from that 80s materialistic sense and kind of scaling down what they have and maybe having fewer better quality 
let's say, things rather than many lesser quality things. So I'm hoping anyway that people are going back to the roots a bit of having something because it means something. I think as well with the dawning of social media and dawning of uh, more people talking about themselves and talking about kind of their and sharing their stories with the world. Um, jewelry gives that kind of perfect opportunity as a starting point. I mean, jewelry was always the kind of, even when it was used in a kind of bragging sense of showing something off because of the background, because of the story. So it's like, oh, I have this and this is this is what it means and this is that. And it was always a talking point. But I think now it could, I mean, yeah, it could stay the same, but I am really hoping that the way that things are going, that it, it will change mm -hmm. and people will start getting more involved in the creation of it. Yeah. I think that a lot of people as well have got to this point where they're fed up of mass production because it's been around for ages. And it was great when it first started because everyone could have the same thing and it was much more affordable. But now, as kind of is the human condition, no one wants to be a carbon copy. Everyone wants to be and is unique. Mm. And so what they own, they, they want and, and should have something that reflects that. There are no two people that are alike. So why should two items be alike? Because it, it does show your personality. It shows your taste. It shows, it shows a lot of you. And so I think that people are more and more wanting that something that's unique that you can't find anywhere else. And that's hopefully where, where it will go because it, it will be a good change as well for um, small businesses and for kind of new designer makers and that sort of thing because it, it has been a, a struggle in the industry for anyone that is self-employed because you're constantly being undercut by big factories in China. And I think there's also an ethical part here that I, I maybe forgot to, to address, um, that in all these mass production items that you had back, back in the day, and that they're still going, because mass production is still very, very strong, mm -hmm. but there is a lot of slave labor and a lot of kind of not very ethical behavior happening when you've got mass production. And back in the day, it was just either accepted or not really known about and just these things happened and so on. But now there's a bit more clarity with it. There's a bit more openness with it. People know that it's happening mm -hmm. and industries, bigger industries are starting to make their changes. But it's still, there's still a lot of bad things happening. And I think that people are getting more and more tuned to this and they're starting to turn more to either industries that don't use this or and they're more environmentally friendly or eco-friendly or human friendly um, and starting to turn back to small businesses because they have that kind of um, traceability. They know that they have gone to that one person and they can trace any, everything back to that one person. Nothing's been harmed, no like um, no chemicals maybe have been used if you go to like a, um, an eco-friendly jeweler and stuff. And I think that's maybe an aspect that will drive it a lot because people are getting more and more aware about the environment and about environmental causes. So that might be another aspect that will push us closer to this kind of smaller makers and actually helping to go back to that original link with jewelry and not just having something that is an accessory but having something that really really means something mm, for sure so yeah. i don't know if that's just pure optimism but i'm i'm hoping that's the direction it's going in i know no i'm the same like i i can only like just be hopeful about this as well like i just yeah I, I, yeah i kind of i do wish that it does but i guess we'll see you know like we're in 2020 we'll see this is giving people a uh, Time to reflect in their own homes, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, even what you're doing now and what I'm hoping to do with some of my videos as well is just kind of get people to think and just actually, this is the time where people have time. They, they can't go out, they can't do anything. They're getting closer and closer to their technology and their machines, which for me is a downside because I do not like tech. I'm not tech savvy. I'm just like, no, please just 
give me something tangible to make. But it does have its upsides that people are investing more time in bettering themselves, educating themselves more, learning, and even just time on videos and, and this sort of thing. So if you if there is content out there that actually helps people and makes them just think a little bit, and I feel that this might actually help define the the course of kind of not maybe global thinking but but hopefully getting there and just having people starting to question the world around them mm. and this is just almost like a global thinking time it's just like right you're always busy going out and doing all these things and being at work and having so many worries about and yeah it's still a worrying time but this is the time to think this is the time to reflect this is the time to step back from everything Thing that you thought you knew and everything that you had for certain in your usual routine and just embrace the fact that you've got time to actually to question these things and and just look look at a different way of, of thinking and educating yourself a bit more to industries that maybe you knew nothing about mm -hmm. um, and you just maybe always a bit curious about. So yeah, I definitely think that your blogs and your videos are are definitely gonna gonna help do this and and help people question what they maybe have overlooked in the past. Exactly. It's yeah. I mean, it's just even it's just like the little littlest things. Like you know, like if one person at least could just like change their minds and just watch like you know our videos and just be like, oh, you know, I never looked at that before. And yeah, it's slowly bit by bit it grows. Absolutely. I mean, change always happens one person at a time mm. and it's not going to be something that happens overnight or, but if, as you said, if, if even just one person just ha slightly changes their mindset or just questions it slightly, then that one person could become two, could become four, could become eight. And then suddenly you've got people that, that are just thinking about things a bit more and, and considering things in new light. Mm. And that's, yeah, that's that's our starting point. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's true. But no, you've got your heads way screwed on. It's it's like. <laughs> the, Let me... <laughs> but no, it's nice speaking to you, and it's it's good to yeah see your grow and and in your process. And it's it's I have to say, like from talking to you, I've been really inspired. It's, oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Well, that's that's kind of my aim at the moment is to try and inspire people that are even at home. They've got kids that they they're needing to homeschool, and that's very very difficult. That's very very hard, but people are doing it astoundingly well, mm -hmm. and and they're looking at different ways of doing it and actually educating them in different subjects, different matters, and and if I can. I mean, even with, with uh, the videos that I'm doing and the videos that you're doing, even if someone like that were to watch a video and actually share it with their kids, I mean, it's it's all stuff that I believe that is is good to get a young mind thinking about as well. And even if it's just sharing some content and like how to design a piece of jewelry and how these are the processes, then you can even start from a, a younger age of going, right, we're going to do a project today and we're going to design something and just give it a go and that sort of thing. And I feel that once someone has tried it and once someone understands also all the back work that goes to creating, I mean, you, you're you the first to know, like you've got years of like just designing and drawing and figuring out what what to do. Um, and just kind of sharing that with people, I think, it's, it's very much knowledge is power. If you understand what's going on behind you, appreciate it a lot more and you can understand it a lot more and you can love it a lot more. So yeah, I think just kind of giving people that kind of tool to allowing them into our little world and going, no, it's fine. It's not scary. Come in, we'll, we'll show you. We'll show you what we do. <laughs> and, uh, I think it's going to be a, a good thing. And if nothing else, people might just find it interesting and even that could change your mindset that's true it's true well it's been so good talking to you and you, you can use it so i hope you enjoyed this interview and this video and a huge thank you to kimmy for organizing this and for such a lovely interview i thoroughly enjoyed it 
And if you have any questions about any of the topics that we covered in this video, then please just comment below. I would love to hear your opinions or any of your questions regarding this. Uh, or if you would like to do it privately, then feel free to message me on social media or through my website. Um, and it's just been an absolute pleasure, as always, talking to you and see you next week.